we have a new screencast lecture. This is titled Measuring Population Size. I want you to say hi to everybody. Hello. Great. Hello. All right, here we go. First, let's do a quick review. See if you can recall the definition of population. Population is all of the organisms of one species in an area. Uh, one of our first new terms will be population density. What is population density? Population density is the number of individuals in a specific area. Let's consider this map, this population density map for feral cats. What this shows you is that in different areas of the state, there will be different numbers of these wild house cats. For example, if you take a look at the legend, the most common is going to be this bright red color. And so if you were just to go somewhere you want to be able to find some wild uh, house cats, you'd want to go in some of these areas here where it's going to be much more common to find the cats very much more densely populated. What about for humans? Let's take a look at a population density map of the United States. If you look at the legend, you can see this is measured in people per square mile. So in this area where this is grayish color, you're going to find less than one person per square mile. So there's going to be hardly anybody around. Very desolate. So if you can see areas like here, here, and here, all the way up to here where you have from 400 to 70,000 people per square mile. And that's going to be areas out here. And you can see that population density throughout the United States is not evenly distributed. You're going to have much higher population densities out here in the East Coast. And you could probably identify some of these areas uh, like out here in California, Los Angeles, um, as you go from the West Coast to the East Coast, here's the Mississippi River, and everywhere east of the Mississippi River is much more densely populated than areas in these uh, states over here, like Wyoming and Utah and Nevada. All those areas have very, very sparsely populated areas, not too many people. So if you want to go somewhere where it's very, very crowded with people, you want to be somewhere here. If you want to go somewhere where you could go all day long and not see another human being, you're going to be out in this area. I think this picture is pretty neat. Here you can see artificial lighting map of the United States, and you would expect to find the more artificial lighting with people where there's going to be more people, especially large cities. So you can see, for example, Minneapolis, uh, Chicago, Detroit, and you go anywhere on the East Coast where New York, Boston, Philadelphia is very, very brightly lit, lots and lots of people in a very small area. And I like this one, too. This is kind of neat. So these are different uh, NFL football teams. Probably shouldn't be a big surprise where you're going to find NFL football teams. There's usually a lot of people because you're not going to have a team like in Wyoming where there's barely anybody. They would have a hard time supporting a professional football teams. So you're going to look at areas where they have very, very high population densities. New York, Philadelphia. Uh, here's Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago. You can see the, the big bump there. Miami. Um, here's Oakland. An interesting thing here, though, if you take a look at this big bump, this is Los Angeles. They don't have an NFL football team. That's pretty odd that the second most populated city in the United States does not have an NFL football team versus where you go over here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where you could barely even see a bump at all. They do have an NFL football team. Okay, that's a look at the United States. What about the world population densities? On this map, the dark red areas are going to be the most crowded, the most densely populated, and the white areas are going to be the least most densely populated. And some of the areas in the world, it shouldn't be a big surprise. Like, for example, here, there's not a whole lot of people living here. That's because that's the Sahara Desert. Up here in Canada, you're not going to see a lot of people living there. It's very, very cold. Uh, Siberia and Russia, same thing. Um, you look at certain desert areas. Um, Australia. Australia is a very large area where the, uh, they call the outback, and there's mostly desert areas. Oops, get back over there. And it's very, very low population density.
This is similar to the map we saw of the United States where it lights up in certain areas. Here you see the eastern United States, very brightly lit, very high population density. Uh, Europe, Western Europe, almost wall-to-wall -wall people there. India, very crowded. Some parts of China, Japan, extremely crowded, very well lit. And again, look at Australia, very dark. You don't have many people living here. Uh, Sahara Desert, etc. The populations of India and China, Indonesia, Japan, this area here, just in this area alone, has more population than the rest of the whole world combined. So you would expect to see very high population densities here and lower population densities in other part of the world. This is the way I like to think about population density. A good way to think about population density is to think about how crowded is it. I'm going to show you pictures of two different forests. Consider which forest is more dense. Way to think about it again is how crowded is it. Here's forest A. Here's forest B. Which one do you think is more dense? Right, of course. Forest B is more dense because it has more trees in the same amount of space. So if you go back and look at this, this forest has this much space. And forest B has about the same amount of space. However, there's far fewer trees in this area than there is in this one. Another way to think about it, if you were in the middle of a forest and you just closed your eyes and just started running randomly around, which one are you more likely to run into something? It's going to be the one that's more dense. This one you're going to want to, uh, this one you're going to be much more likely to run into something than in this forest. Population density can be calculated. I'm going to run through a sample here. So if you consider our classroom, hello, you consider our classroom, let's um, th picture that our classroom has, so let's say, 28 students. Now, if our classroom has 28 students and we measure the area of the classroom itself, and our classroom has 60 square yards of space. So what is the population density of our classroom? And we're going to measure that in students per square yard. So to be able to do that, we're going to need to use this formula. Write this formula down. Population density is equal to the number of things, whatever it is. In this case, we're going to be doing using students as our number of things. And the amount of space is going to be whatever space is available. In this case, we're going to use the amount of space in the classroom, which is 60 square yards. So 28 students divided by 60 square yards. And when we calculate that out, we get the total of 0.5 students per square yard. And of course, we're not going to literally have half of a student, so we'd probably want to calculate a little, a little differently so we can think about how many square yards of area, of classroom area, does each student have. Well, there's half a student per square yard, so that would mean that each student is going to have two square yards. So when you're sitting in the classroom, the science classroom, do you have two square yards of space just to yourself? So in other words, you could reach out three feet to your right, three feet to your left, you, three feet in front of you, three feet behind you. You should not hit anybody. You should have all of that space all to yourself. Is that what it's really like? Well, of course not. No, you have less. If you started doing this and waving your arms around, you definitely are probably going to hit somebody. So why does the calculation come out to be two square yards per, per student when we really don't have two square yards per student? Well, that's because there's going to be other things in the classroom taking up space besides just students. Like you're all compressed into the area where the student desks are. Um, the teacher space where I'm up up front, we have all that tile area where no students sit. The uh, area in the back where there's shelving and counters and things like that, that's area where the students aren't going to be. And so there's actually less space available and the people are pushed into a much smaller area than really is possibly available to them. Now let's say we want to increase the population density of our classroom. If this was a model of our classroom, so we have this much space in the classroom, when we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight students in the classroom, 
So each student roughly has about this much space. How can we increase the population density? Well, one way to do it would be to increase the total number of students. So if we add more students, it will definitely be more crowded in the classroom. A uh, second way to increase the population density of the classroom, in other words, to make it more crowded, would be to decrease the amount of space available. So if there's less space available, even though there's the same amount of students, it will be more crowded, they will have less space for themselves, thus a higher population density. Different species will have different population density distribution. Here's a few video clips. Now, the first type is going to discuss aggregated population density distribution. The most common pattern of distribution is aggregated, in which members of the population tend to live in groups. Many species form family or social groupings, such as elephant herds, baboon troops, flocks of birds, or schools of fish. Flocks provide many eyes on the lookout for localized food, such as a tree full of fruit. Schooling fish avoid predation by confusing the predator with countless flashing bodies darting in all directions. Some species, such as elephant seals, form temporary aggregations for mating. Other plant or animal populations cluster not for social reasons, but because resources such as nutrients, shelter, or water are localized. For example, cottonwood trees grow along streams and rivers and grasslands, while many species of animals aggregate around water holes in the dry savanna of Africa. Uniformly distributed organisms maintain a relatively constant distance between individuals. Spacing is often the result of defending scarce resources, such as breeding sites, nutrients, or water. This distribution occurs most frequently among animals that defend territories. Shorebirds and others, like these African penguins, are also found often in evenly spaced nests just out of reach of one another. Other territorial species, such as many birds of prey, mate for life, and mating pairs continuously occupy well-defined, very large, and relatively uniformly spaced territories. Desert plants growing in poor soil with limited water, such as the creosote bush, have chemical spacing mechanisms that assure adequate resources for each individual. Likewise, many animals, such as large cats, mark their territories by chemical means to avoid violent face-to-face -face confrontations. Random distribution is the least common. Here, individuals do not form social groups. The resources they need are equally available throughout the area they inhabit, and resources are not scarce enough to require territorial spacing. Trees and other plants and rainforests come close to being randomly distributed. There are probably no vertebrate species that maintain random distribution throughout the year because they must breed, a behavior that makes social interaction inevitable. But other than breeding and coming together to feed at prime feeding locations during salmon runs, bears spend most of their time largely in randomly spaced isolation from one another, except, of course, sows and their cubs. Population size. What is population size? Population size is the number or the amount of the members of a species in an area. Now, let's say we're trying to figure out the population size of rabbits in a forest area. What are some reasons that this could be a difficult task to accomplish? First of all, rabbits don't just sit still. They can run, they can hide, they blend in with their surroundings real well. It can make it very difficult for you to find all the rabbits. And another reason why this would be difficult as well is even once you do find them, a lot of them look very similar to one another. So how do you know which ones you counted, which ones you have not? You wouldn't want to count the same one multiple times. So what could you do to help solve this problem? You could use tagging. You can mark the individuals that you have captured and counted. And that way as well, if you give them identification numbers, you'll be able to track their movements and also learn a lot about the way that the animal population behaves. Sea turtle numbers are tumbling all around the world. Researchers need to know where they are going. You can't protect an animal if you haven't a clue where it is. These guys can hold their breath for 20 minutes. And this one... Easy to turn a drone. The turtle I've just caught is a loggerhead. 
one of the biggest and certainly the furthest travelled of them all. Hey, the boy. Well done. Well, because that's the hardest species to catch. Incredibly quick. By checking the tags and analysing the DNA of loggerheads, researchers have discovered something almost unbelievable. K35313. Loggerhead turtles born here in Australia have turned up on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, off the coast of California, 7,000 miles away. Some turtles swim right across the Pacific Ocean. That's one third the way around the world. Here's another way to, for counting several organisms in an area. Instead of going out and counting every single rabbit in an area, you can use a technique that is often used by political polls and things like that, especially a presidential election. It's in the news a lot, and you might see something like this. Like, oh, 53% of people support Mitt Romney, 44% of people support Barack Obama for president. Now, do they call every single voter in the United States? Of course not. That'd be ridiculous. So what they do is they use sample counts. So maybe they'll call 5,000 people uh, from various places around the, the uh, United States. And from that, they would use that information to extrapolate and figure out what the whole country would think in the situation without actually asking every single person in the whole country. Scientists use sample counts for organisms to estimate population density of, of an ecosystem. Sample counts. So sample counts, you could think about them this way. Well, if you have a large number of an organism that you wish to count, you may use estimates. Uh, and one way to estimate is called sampling. Imagine you're in this situation where you have 16 acres of forest. Instead of counting every single tree in the forest, what you could do is choose one of the acres. Let's say you count all the trees in that one acre and you come up with 40 maple trees. Or so there's 41, 40 maple trees. Ah, how in the world did I do that? Let's put that back. So there's 40 maple trees in one acre. So we're going to estimate the number of maple trees in the entire forest. The way to do that is we figure that there are 40 maple trees in one acre and we have 16 total acres. So we're going to multiply 40 times 16, and we come up with the number 640. So 640 total maple trees we're going to estimate in the entire forest. Will this be the exact amount of maple trees in this forest? Probably not, because some of the acres may have more than 40 trees, some may have less. Um, it is possible we chose the acre to count that is really strange, has like a ridiculously more maple trees in this acre than anywhere else, and so that could throw our numbers off quite a bit. So one way to try to reduce the amount of error that that could cause would be to, number one, choose the acre that we're going to use randomly. Number two, we could choose to use more than just one acre. Like, for example, maybe we'll choose four acres randomly, so maybe it's going to be this one, maybe it's going to be this one, two, three, Four. So these four random acres, and we could count up how many trees are in all four acres, and let's say you get 100, so then you would go, okay, well, 100 maple trees divided by four acres would be 25 maple trees per acre, and then you would use that 25 maple trees per acre and multiply it by 16, and that could give you your estimate. And hopefully that would be a more accurate number than if you just chose one acre. Well, that's all, folks. That's all for tonight. So hopefully you learned something, and we'll catch you next time. See ya! Be careful, kids! Bye!